Hello, my amazing AP students. Just gonna get myself into present mode. Um, this is your video for chapter five, part two. We're gonna be talking about proteins and nucleic acids, those last very important macromolecules to cover. Um, in the last video, part one, we went over um, carbohydrates and the monomers or bricks of carbohydrates we know are, excuse me, monosaccharides, okay? Uh, for our lipids macromolecule section, we learned that our monomers are one glycerol with three fatty acids. Um, and we also learned the different types of lipids, um, specifically focusing on fats and steroids, but we also learned about waxes and phospholipids. All right. So into proteins, okay? So why do we need to know about proteins? Hopefully you're thinking when you think about proteins, I think meat um, and the fact that, you know, we eat meat to get proteins as part of the nutrients that we need, okay? So we're going to really talk about what are these critical functions that proteins play in the body. So let's look at a few. All right, so... You can kind of just, let me make myself small so you can use this as something to kind of scan around um, when you go back to this video, I hope, and review protein functions. Um, so you can think hair and nails, right? Like the protein keratin builds hair and nails. Um, we could also think about the protein hemoglobin in our blood, okay? So I want you to think about this, this is a really, really important protein in the body. One red blood cell carries 250 million hemoglobin in every single red cell, red blood cell in your body, okay? And what, how many oxygens can hemoglobin hold? Four. So 250 million times four, that's a billion. So in every single one of your red blood cells, thanks to the protein hemoglobin, you're able to carry around a billion oxygen atoms. That's amazing, okay? So, um, if we look at brain functioning um, and, and nerves, right, so they're critical for um, cell signaling, right? Um, they're really, really critical as enzymes um, to catalyze reactions. We talked about that a little bit in a, a prior video. Um, they're excellent um, cell construction workers. They are responsible for cellular messaging, um, immune response. We see antibodies here. So they're super important, okay? So let's talk about what are the bricks for amino acids? Bricks meaning the monomer, okay? So the bricks, one of the bricks for proteins are amino acids, excuse me. So let's break down this amino acid structure, okay? Because it's going to be the same for every amino acid and we'll see where we'll, we see a variation. Okay, but I want you to right out the gate, when you look at this structure, we know this is an amino acid. So let's go break through what you should be able to identify so that you can immediately recognize, okay, that's an amino acid. And I know amino acid is the monomer or the building block to create a polymer of a protein. Okay, so when I look at this, um, the first thing I'm going to see is that there's a carbon in the center, and then I have four bonds coming off of that main carbon, that central carbon, okay? So if I go straight up, it's a hydrogen bond from that central carbon, okay? Then if I look to the right, hopefully this functional group is jumping out at you. So we have a carboxyl group, okay? And then um, we know that if we put this in an aqueous solution, because sometimes there's a uh, we see this um, negative charge on this oxygen. Why? Because if we lose a hydrogen right here in an aqueous solution, we think back to acids, right? That's the level of hydrogen concentration in a solution, okay? So if we lose that hydrogen, where did it go? Well, you can see over here, isn't that a positive charge on this hydrogen on the amino side? So, and hopefully this is also jumping out to you as another functional group. So we have our carboxyl group, we have our amino group. All right. So um, finally, and, and I, this, this, 
um, idea that there's a negative charge and there's a positive charge, that's actually going to be very critical um, and an important component of how these amino acids behave. Put a pin in it because we're going to break it down when we get to um, structure, okay? So there's the final piece of the equation here. So we've gone over upstairs is the hydrogen. To the right, we have our carboxyl group negatively charged. We have our amino group that's positively charged. And then we have our R group. Now, I know I told you in former lessons that when you see that R, it means the rest of the molecule. And that's totally correct. But there's another type of R, okay, specifically related to amino acids. And that R group is going to dictate what type of amino acid it is. Okay, and so all of these different R groups, they all have different properties. And we, I keep hammering this point with you guys, structure is related to functionality. So these R groups are all gonna have different types of structures. Therefore, the amino acid is going to have different types of functionality. So let's take a look at some of these examples. All right, there's my face right on top of everything. And I moved it. Okay, so let's break this down. Okay, so here are a few examples of those R groups, okay? And so hopefully you're seeing a common theme as you look through all four of these amino acids, okay? Hopefully you're seeing the carboxyl group on the right, the hydrogen up top, and your amino group on the left side of the molecule. And then you're hopefully seeing some variation in the R groups, okay? You can see they all have different names based on their R group. So for this um, alanine right here, okay, this is a very simple um, R group. It's just bonded to another carbon and an H and three hydrogens, CH3. Okay, so single carbon around three hydrogens. We move down here and we see valine, okay? So same thing, it's bonded to a carbon hydrogen and you can see that those are then bonded to um, to two more carbons, all right? So then um, we have this cysteine group, which is actually the R group is bonded to a sulfur group. You can see that S right there. Um, and these can actually form something called cysteine bridges, okay? So you can have two cysteines that are right next to each other and the hydrogens kind of hang on to each other. Um, and then we see down here, we see phenylalanine. Um, and so this R group, um, you can see, my little thing is blocking it, so I'm gonna move my mouse out of the way. Um, this is not drawn to scale, but you can see um, that there are, that thing won't get out of my way. Uh, so I won't point over there, but you see that the R group has a CH group and then beneath it, you can see, um, it just keeps blocking it for you. Um, you can see that there is a, another ringed carbon and you can see there's double bonds uh, within those carbons. All right, so the next one's gonna look a little smaller, but I wanna just go through a couple of um, variations of these amino acids um, and show how sometimes their R groups can be negatively charged or positively charged and how that can affect the behavior of that amino acid. So let me, so I switched out the image here. I, I prefer this um, diagram here for the 20 different amino acids, okay? And I know that it's kind of smaller, but it more, it shows better and defines better the nonpolar R groups versus your polar R groups, okay? So let's first look at um, the R groups that are considered Nonpolar. Okay, so um, let's look at, for example, glycine right here. So hopefully you're again seeing that common structure with the carboxyl, hydrogen, and your amino group, and then the variation here is only in the R group. Okay, so glycine super simple. It's just one hydrogen, just a single hydrogen bond. Okay, um, let's look at. Um, let's see, where's tryptophan? Okay, maybe you've heard of tryptophan before. So tryptophan is that um, amino acid in turkey that when you eat lots of turkey, if you've ever been really sleepy after Thanksgiving dinner, that's thanks to the amino acid tryptophan. Um, okay, and so you can see there's some variation in these different R groups. 
Okay. And so um, when you see that they are nonpolar, okay, nonpolar R groups, that means they are hydrophobic. So are they going to dissolve, dissolve in water? Hopefully you are saying no. Hopefully no, you're, they're not dissolving in water. That, that's what your thought is. All right. So now let's look at our second group. Okay. And these are amino acids that have an R group that is polar. So when you think polar, hopefully you're thinking, is it going to interact well with water? Yes, because there's a charge. Okay. So um, let's take a look at, um, let's see, let's take a look at our cysteine. Okay. So we talked about that extra sulfur group on the end. Um, we've got a, a bunch of variations. We have, um, Let's see, which ones do I want to call out to you? We could look at glutamine, right? So um, glutamine has significantly more complex. We have another CH group and then another carbon bonded to a nitrogenous group and a double bond to an oxygen. So all of these different variety of structures of these R groups is going to give the amino acid different types of function. Okay, so um, we have... To summarize this, I really want you to just gain the concept that there are going to be polar R groups and non-polar R groups. Um, and those polar ones are going to be hydrophilic and the non-polar are going to be hydrophobic, okay? So now let's look at this third group of amino acids, okay? So you can see um, that the, the C, where am I? You can see in this third group, like for example, I see in this R group that an oxygen has lost a hydrogen. So that means that this is an ionized group, meaning that an ion, meaning that there's not the same amount of protons as there are electrons whizzing around, right? So if it's an ion, do you think that it's going to be hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hopefully you're saying hydrophilic, okay, because if there's a charged end, like you see on, on this amino acid, if there's a charged end, right, then water can associate itself so that if it's a negative charge on that R group, then what's going to point towards those negative charges? Hopefully you're thinking the hydrogens in water, right, because the, the hydrogens in water are partially electropositive because their electrons are getting ganked closer to the oxygen, okay? But if the R group is, in, uh, is ionized in its overall positive charge, then instead the oxygens of water will be oriented um, towards those R groups, okay? So it's really this, the ionized group will really tell you about orientation of water molecules around it. All right, so this is all 20 of your amino acids. And so now let's talk about how we join the monomers of two individual amino acids and bring them together to start to form a polymer. All right, so um, quick reminder. So what is the brick? The monomer are amino acids. We're trying to build proteins. Okay, how are we gonna do it? Same way we were building fats and carbohydrates with dehydration synthesis. So for us to join these two monomers, and hopefully you're seeing, again, that very um, constant setup where we have the carboxyl group, hydrogen, and our nitrogenous, um, I'm sorry, our, um, our amino group on this side, same exact on this amino. So how do we bond these two monomers together? We bond them through dehydration synthesis. We're going to remove the hydrogen from this amino acid and an OH group from this one. Through that process, that's dehydrating out one molecule of water, and we are then creating what is called a peptide bond, okay? Now, there are some rules to how these two are going to bond to each other and what side is going to bond with what, okay? So when I look at this single molecule, um, this single amino acid molecule, okay, there are two sides to the amino acid. There is the C-terminus side and there is the N-terminus side. Okay, and so where do the where do the two monomers then bond? Well, 
the C terminus side of one amino acid will bond with the N terminus side of the other amino acid. Okay, and so you can see um, that they, so if we apply this to dehydration synthesis, that means I'm going to take the hydrogen off of the N terminus end of one amino acid. I'm going to take the OH group off of the C terminus end of another amino acid so that I can now bond them together and create a peptide bond. Okay, so that's a special type of bond that takes place between amino acids called a peptide bond. Okay, and hopefully when you saw these two amino acids, if we go back, what amino acid is this with a simple hydrogen? Let's go back and look. Are we seeing it? Are we seeing it? No. Are we seeing it here? Yes, it's glycine. Okay. So glycine is uh, the amino acid I was using here in this um, example. Okay. So this directionality part, it's very, very important. You only can add new amino acids as we're continuing to build more and more amino acids chained on top of each other. You can only add new amino acids to the C terminus end. So you can see if I want to add another glycine, am I going to add it here on the N terminus side or on the C terminus side? Hopefully you're saying we would add it onto the C terminus side. All right, so now let's talk about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. All right, so I'm going to go and try and find a piece of wire so that I can bend things around and try to uh, show you. So let me make myself big. And I'm going to go and try and find a wire. Okay, so let's first talk about primary structure. I can't find a wire in my apartment anywhere, of course, but I will use my microphone because it bends. Check that out. So fancy. All right, so um, if we're talking about primary structure, primary structure is simply the um, sequence of amino acids. So if I were to look at my primary structure, it would just be amino acid, amino acid, amino acid, and what sequence, okay? Is it a cysteine with a glycine, whatever? What is the arrangement of, of amino acids in a row? That's primary structure. Then we move on to secondary structure, okay? So if we remember that we learned about directionality, okay, and we learned that when we look at that end terminus end, and it has that plus charge, right? And we looked at the carboxylin end, and it had that negative charge, what do opposites do? They attract, okay? So what proteins will do is what they enter into is a secondary structure, and that's based on how the opposites are attracting, okay? And so there's really two shapes that you're going to see, okay? So you're either going to see something called an alpha helix, which looks kind of like this. I'll swirl it around to show you. Okay. Alpha helix looks like a twisted shape. Or we have a beta pleated sheet, which will look like this. Okay, and so something key that you need to know about secondary structure, it's not dependent on the R groups, not one bit. Okay, it doesn't matter what the R groups are. The secondary structure is either going to be those alpha helix or the beta pleated sheets. And it's solely dependent on the amino group, whether it has a positive charge, right? And if the carboxyl group has a negative, okay? So primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids. Our secondary structure is either the alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet, okay? and totally dependent on the carboxyl and amino group and their interactions, okay? Then we have tertiary structure. So tertiary structure is something, essentially we're gonna see how do, if we go back to those R groups that were either hydrophilic or hydrophobic, right? So basically within this initially, now pr first primary, then let's say this was our secondary structure, so it's beta pleated, okay? Now we're gonna be talking about how do the R groups interact with each other? 
So the philics, the hydrophilic R groups, they're going to want to hang out with each other. The hydrophobic groups, they're going to want to hang out with each other. So now all of a sudden tertiary structure is dependent on the R groups. And so that shape will be fully dependent on the uh, where the R groups are, what type of R groups are present, okay? And basically the structure will fold in on itself and like will go with like. So if I have my beta pleated sheet, okay, and I have a whole bunch of hydrophobic amino acids right here where my index finger is, and I have a whole bunch also right here where this other index finger is, these two hydrophobics are going to want to fold towards each other and touch, okay? Same with the hydrophilics. They're going to want to touch. Okay. And so you start seeing them um, folding into each other all based on the R groups that are present. Okay. So then finally, um, we have our quaternary structure. Okay. And that depends on multiple amino acid chains linking up together. Okay. And so um, if you have an, more than one amino acid change and they start hooking together, that's when we get quaternary structure. So I've had that tertiary structure where I just told you where the, the phyllics and the phobics are hanging out with each other. Now I'm adding in another, um, another group of, uh, of amino acids, another tertiary structure, all bent up protein, right? And I'm going to hook it up with this current tertiary structure um, peptide chain. And now I've got quaternary structure. I have a relationship between two polypeptide chains. Okay. And so that shape has to be perfect because shape in proteins is all about functionality. So where that those two tertiary structured proteins hook up to create their quaternary structure, that will be critical to their functionality. Okay, and so let's just move my face out of the way and we can kind of see a summary of what I was just talking about. Okay, so we have our primary structure. It's just the sequence of amino acids, which then moves to our secondary structure where we can either have the alpha helix or that beta pleated sheet, which then transfers into tertiary structure where like wants to hang out with like, right? So our hydrophobics and this, so then remember tertiary structure is all about R groups. With the R groups that are similar to each other, they want to hang out with each other, right? Fold towards each other. Quaternary structure is where we're incorporating multiple tertiary structures of different um, amino acid chains together, okay? And so now let's get to our notes because I think I was doing a lot of talking and I abandoned your group shared notes. So go ahead and let's jump into where it says the protein section. Okay, so what are our functions of proteins? I gave you most of them. Enzymes, muscles, hormones, antibodies, hemoglobin, carriers, and channels in cell membranes. Okay, so that's your fill-in, cell membranes. Okay, number two is talking about amino acids. That is the monomer. That's the brick. That's the building block for our macromolecule proteins. Okay, so what is the structure? It's a central alpha carbon bonded to, and then hopefully you're thinking back to, those three common bonds that are on all amino acids, right? We have our carboxyl group, we have our amino group, and we have our hydrogen up top, and then Hanging down on the, off the bottom, we have our R group, okay? So in letter B, carboxyl group, the carboxyl is which terminus? Is it the C terminus or the N terminus end? Let's go back and have our, our structure here. So our carboxyl group is at the C terminus. So that's um, going to be your fill-in for B. And your amino group for letter A, that's going to be over here that's at the N terminus, okay? Back to letter B, new amino acids are added to the C terminus end of the polypep polypeptide through, what process? Dehydration synthesis. What type of special bond is created? A peptide bond, 
okay? What is the third component here? So for letter C for amino acids, a hydrogen atom. I'm sorry, up here, this is, this is our R group, okay? A hydrogen atom. And then finally, there's our R group. This is a very simple R group because this amino acid is glycine, so it literally is just a hydrogen. Um, and so for our definition for R group, R group, which determines the identity of the amino acid, how many are there? There are 20 different R groups, and the R group determines the chemical properties of the amino acid. Is it acidic, basic, polar, nonpolar, right? And then we, that then dictates function. Is it going to be hydrophilic, hydro, hydrophobic? How is it going to behave in water, et cetera? All right. So then we can also talk about our – well, I'll leave this slide up here as we talk about peptide bonds. So – what type of bond is a peptide bond? It is a covalent bond between two amino acids, okay? So it's the amino group meeting with the carboxyl group, okay? And then in terms of directionality, it's defined as amino acids have two ends, two ends that are chemically distinct from one another. Right? We have a carboxyl on one side, chemically distinct from our amino group on the other side. Okay, what is a polypeptide? I gave you the definition, it's a chain of amino acids. Okay, and then we, I'm, I'm asking you to just summarize um, the structure. Okay, and also there is a link to a great Khan Academy video if you need some more refresh on, on primary, secondary, tertiary structure. So primary, primary structure is the sequence of amino acids in the chain. So sequence of amino acids in chains. What is secondary structure? So secondary structure, remember it has nothing to do with the R groups. It is due to the charged amino and carboxyl groups. Okay, which create either, what are the two shapes? Either alpha helix or beta pleated sheets. Okay, then we move on to tertiary structure, which does have to do with the R groups. So, and, and that's really the, that's your fill-in, tertiary, due to R group interactions. Okay, due to R group interactions, all of the bonds, hydrogen, co covalent, disulfide, ionic, they are three-dimensional folding patterns imposed on top of the secondary structure. Okay. Then finally, we move on to quaternary structure. So this is when you have two or more of these polypeptide chains coming together, okay? So two or more polypeptide chains combining or coming together. All right. So now we are on to talking about um, chaperone proteins and really how does this folding happen? What is What is allowing this folding to start to take place? So let's start to talk about that. So first of all, I keep harping on it, but I, I will because it's so critical, right? This folding that takes place, if it doesn't happen perfectly, then that means that the shape isn't going to be correct. And then it means that the protein's not going to be working correctly, okay? So what is making sure the folding takes place and what is making sure that it's being folded into the exact perfect shape? Well, there are proteins called chaperone proteins, okay? And chaperone proteins, they are, they're fantastic because they can take um, a protein that's been damaged and they can um, try to fix the shape of that protein, okay? And refold it and try to correct the shape if it wasn't folded correctly. Um, or if it is to the point of, of disrepair and it cannot be refolded correctly, then that means that the protein loses all of its functionality. And so that chaperone protein will help get rid of it. Okay. Um, and so we're going to talk in a moment about what are misform proteins. Okay. And what kind of damage can they cause? So quickly, before we talk about these, those um, damaged proteins, let's just talk about protein um, denaturation, okay? So basically when a folded protein 
becomes denatured, when it changes its shape, it loses its functionality. So let's think about it in reference to um, a protein that a lot of us eat, like eggs, okay? So when you put your, you crack the egg and you put it in the pan, right? The clear egg white, it, it, it's clear until you apply heat. When you apply, and that, that clear white egg white is made of protein, okay? The second that you add heat, what starts to happen to that clear egg white? Hopefully you're telling me that it starts to change color and it starts to turn white. So heat changed that protein, right? Now, can you can we unfry that egg? Can we go back and make it not white anymore and make it go back to being a clear egg white? No, right? That was permanent damage. We permanently changed, we permanently denatured that protein, okay? So another example could be, because sometimes it's not permanent. Let's think about like all of the ladies who are uh, straightening their hair or curling their hair. So like my hair is naturally curly, we know this. If I were to straighten it, right, it would denature the keratin um, proteins that my hair is made out of, but it wouldn't be permanently denatured because what happens when I'm going to go shower? My my blowout or my, my straightened hair is going to, once it gets wet again, it'll be curly again. So there are times when um, denaturing something is not permanent, and then there's times when it is, okay? Um, so a really good example of this in terms of relating to health, okay? So why is it really, really bad when someone is running a really high fever? So let's think about proteins, right? When they're undergoing intense heat, they change. And when they change their shape, they change their functionality. So a really, really high fever could actually end up causing brain damage because you're damaging and denaturing the proteins in your brain, okay? Which could then, you know, cause permanently misfolded proteins um, and brain damage. So that's why we try to get people with a high fever for their fever to go down. So let's talk about prions, okay? So prions are permanently misfolded. Um, and they're really bad at, because they trigger other proteins to also misfold. And there's a lot of diseases that are related to um, prions and, um, and, and prion function, okay? And so let's get, I think, yeah, we need to add to our folding parts of our notes. So what are chaperone proteins? They help them to fold into their correct shape when they are built. Okay. Number two, what is denaturation? When proteins are exposed to extremes in heat and pH, they undergo an irreversible change. Excuse me. And then prions, they cause certain diseases. They are misfolded proteins. All right. So now let's take a look at that summary chart. So we have our carbohydrates, which we went through right, with our polymers being starch, glycogen in animals, cellulose in plants, chitin in fungus. Um, we went through our lipids. The monomers are for fats. It's a fatty acid chain um, with a glycerol. We learned that steroids are those carbon rings. These are the different polymers. And now we've just learned our proteins. So um, you have this image here that I really want that to be sunk into your brain. You can immediately identify that as a monomer of proteins, the amino acid with the distinctive carboxyl group, hydrogen on the top and amino group. And then on the bottom, we have our R group, which there are 20 different amino um, acid R groups that we could put here. Okay. And so what are some of their polymers um, and some of their functions? They're over here. All right. But sorry to just go back. The polymers are those polypeptide chains. So when we bond a whole bunch of amino acids together. All right. So this is where we're going to uh, pause so that you guys can kind of munch through, get through, go back um, and reevaluate your protein information. Go back to your unit one hyperdoc. Make sure that you're filling in your um, video notes. And then the next video, we're going to do nucleic acids because I don't want to give you super, super long videos.